Uh, to, so to kick off our afternoon, we have our second fireside with a Jose Stella, and I'm moderated by Brian O'Connor. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm Brian O'Connor. Actually, I, I thought I had a good relationship with, with Mark Hoffman until I just heard him refer to me as expletive Brian O'Connor. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. And Jose, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Um, briefly, uh, Jose Stella is the co-CEO and co-founder of QMC Telecom International Holdings, a multinational provider of wireless infrastructure. Prior to that, he was the CEO and co-founder of View Media until the sale of the company to Lamar Advertising in 2006. At the time of the sale, View was Puerto Rico's largest locally owned outdoor advertising company. He, along with his business partner, Pochito, received the 2004 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for, uh, for, for that work, and, and, and specifically in, in Puerto Rico. Throughout the years, he has served on several boards of directors, uh, and, and he, he graduated also from uh, Babson College uh, and earned his MBA from the University of Michigan. So please join me in welcoming Jose Stella uh, to our fireside. Thank you. So, and, and on a personal note, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jose and his partner Pochito uh, since 2010 when they uh, made, uh, had made the courageous move of investing in my search fund fellowship capital partner. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in a much more casual environment. Great. Um, so uh, Jose, why don't you give us a little bit of background? I, I, I shared sort of your professional and educational accolades there. Can you tell us a little bit more about QMC and, and, and broadly what you're up to today? Great. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for you know, inviting me, and, and, and I love always being back in Chicago. I've lived here for a while, a while ago, uh, and um, I'm really excited about the conference and the opportunity to be here sharing some experiences. Although, I am a little bummed out. You know, I, I, before, I used to get invited to the young CEO experience <laughs> panels, uh, <laughs> and now I'm not. So... <laughs> I don't know. Let's, you know, we'll take it from there, okay? Evolution of ETA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you want me to go a little bit into QMC? Today, what, what you're up to today. Yeah, and, so, and QMC. so I give you yeah. a little bit of the background on how I got involved also with search funds, okay? Yeah. So my partner and I, we've been partnered for over 20 years, so everything we've done on an entrepreneurial basis, we've done it together. And, uh, we're both co-CEO and co-founders of QMC International, as you mentioned which is a tower operator in, in we operate mostly in, in, we operate in four countries in Latin America. Um, uh, and, and, and in order to get that business running, I, I am originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, born and raised, but moved my family and my partner also moved his family to Sao Paulo. So for the last five years, we've been trying to assimilate the uh, Paulist, uh, we're trying to assimilate the Paulistano lifestyle. Um, uh, how I got involved in search funds was, uh, you know, our first startup, we ended up actually raising a search fund and that ended up being in a startup uh, that we did in the billboard advertising industry. Um, that uh, that um, we, we were lucky enough to operate that for six years, make it the largest outdoor advertising company in, in the Caribbean and Central America. It sold that to a, a publicly traded U.S. company, gave our investors a 55% a, a IRR, about 15 times net their money. Uh, and, no, no. And, 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 you know, and I think part of the search fund community is all about, you know, it's, it's, it's all about, like it was mentioned earlier today, it's all about learning and sharing. And I, I think our, what, what we see as our duty to the community is that we keep involved in it. You know, as of today, we, I think we have about, uh, I keep forgetting the statistics, I'm sorry, but we have about 40 operating companies we're invested in and about 16 ongoing searches right now. Excellent. Yeah. Well, the, the ETA community appreciates your support and all that you've done. Uh, and we do have many international uh, audience members today, and so we'll get into a little bit of like the international dynamic and some of the maybe unique challenges of uh, raising a search fund outside of the US. But, but before we do that, um, because this is the Booth Kellogg ETA conference and not the investment banking conference, I think everybody would like to hear a little bit about you outside of the professional accolades that we've just, uh, uh, we've just uh, obviously talked about here. Yeah, so, so, so when I look at life outside, you know, I mean, it, it's difficult to separate your personal life from your entrepreneurial life, right? Because 
um, and you don't have if uh, keep keep using foul language at this conference, you don't have fucker rights, right? The buck stops with you, right? So, so for me, it is, it is a dichotomy of, a, for me, it's a dichotomy of, of, of how you balance your professional goals in life with your family goals. And, 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 and I think that's the ultimate measure of success, right? It's, 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 you know, was I successful? There's no free lunch. Right, and it is yes. I am. I want to be successful at the business I am, but that doesn't make me a whole person. And and what those other elements come to the table that make you a whole person, right? In my personal opinion, it's about my personal development. It's about my family's personal development, and and managing that, it's very easily said here, and very very hard to get it done in real life. Sure. So uh, you graduated with honors from Michigan. Uh, you went and did a year here in Chicago at KPMG. Tell us about that decision uh, to, to follow this you know, unique path. And, and back in uh, 2004, was it, that you made that decision? 2006, I believe, two, two, to two, go two, search fund route. Yes, correct. Yeah. So, so t talk us a, a little bit about the decision post-MBA to, to do this stint at KPMG and then ultimately to go out and raise a search fund? So, I mean, for us, it's, for me, the, why we did a search fund is just a function of a, of a lifelong expectation I have of myself, and my partner will tell you the same thing, my business partner, about, about doing something entrepreneurial with our lives. You know, Rafael and I met when we were working at, we were uh, out of college, we were hired by, by Chase, Manhattan Bank uh, doing in the corporate finance division. And, and, and for us, that job was just a stepping stone into our entrepreneurial careers. Back then, we didn't know there was a, such a thing as a search fund, right? We thought our game plan was, you know, we'll do this thing, we'll go do MBAs, go into investment banking, save some money. When we're 40, we'll move back to the island and, and buy a company. You know, back then we were young and foolish, right? We had all these clients and we thought we were better than all of them. And today we don't say that. We say we're as good as them. You know, we can do at least, you know, a, a, as good as job. But there was a, you know, we had this lifelong motivation. We worked, you know, we got those jobs in order to build our skill sets, in order to learn more about how business was done to get our, our, I specifically went into banking, to see many different industries, to see what stuff I liked. And, and then we went back and did the MBAs. The issue was that in MBA school, uh, you know, uh, 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 I remember I was working here in Chicago. I had finished I'm a year ahead of Rafael. Um, and, and he calls me up and he says, oh, you know, you know, we always talk about doing something entrepreneurial when we're, you know, when we're 40. He goes, well, I, I think that's not the formula. I, you know, why don't you come over here and, 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 and I introduce you to Irv Grosbeck and, and, and we take it from there. And, and that's kind of how we ended up in the search fund. The search fund was just the right vehicle for personal ambitions we have had for a very long time in our lives. Sure, so, so uh, Rafael, this is actually the first time I've heard you refer to him as Rafael. It's oh, it's, yeah, it's Pochito. <laughs> Nobody knows him by Rafael, yes. So, so, uh, so Pochito came to you with this idea. You met yeah. with Irv Grosbeck. Tell, tell us a little bit about why uh, Pochito was the right partner for you and sort of that, that path and exploring your partnership and that, that still exists today. Yep, yeah, so Pochito and I, you know, I, I mean, our personal relationship first develops as a professional relationship. And, and, and what we found out at Chase was that, that we were, you know, we had, even though we had very similar technical skills in our professional lives, we were very complementary in our personalities and, and other attributes. And, 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 and it was the whole concept of doing something entrepreneurial alone or in a partnership. And we both knew in our personal, le at the very deep personal levels, that we work extremely well together. Going through something entrepreneurial, it is an emotional thing. So you, if you find somebody who's, in my own personal opinion, right, you find somebody who is a great work fit with you, who, who, <laughs> can be there for the ups and downs of running, of, of trying to start and run in a company. And if you truly believe that the two together are, 
you know, the value you can create is exponential and not additive. It makes a hell of a lot of sense to do it. Yeah. And that's exactly kind of how our analysis went. And, and we developed, you know, we got partnership rules. We developed plenty of things that went on, but, but that's how we actually did it. Yeah, can you, can, if you would, give us a little bit of a look inside those partnership rules. I mean, um, you know, when conducting a search or running a small business, it's, you know, not uncommon that you might spend more time with your, more waking hours during the day with your business partner than with your spouse or significant other. Tell, tell us a little bit about those rules of the partnership and yeah. how you maybe manage through some inevitable conflict. Yeah, but many jokes about that, right? You do spend more time with your business partner than with your wife, you know, and, and it, people who know us well always kid us because at the beginning, scrappy entrepreneurs, you know, we travel and share one room, you know, and <laughs> we're, we still do that today out of, we're used to it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine all the jokes that go around the community, right? Uh, 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 but, but it's funny. Anyway, uh, I'm starting to question it myself. Uh, 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 but so, this seems like as good a format as any to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the partnership rules, you know, we identify early on that as a line as we wear, one of the things that could lead us to failure was the relationship not developing in a healthy way. And partnerships always have um, a, a, a differences. I mean, it's impossible to have two people in the same room that are always in agreement with the same thing. You know, what we knew of each other was that we shared the same common set of personal values. And, 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 and that drives us. But we, we were very methodical and, and purpose-driven in, in, in talking about different situations that life would take us. You know, uh, uh, for example, what happens if one of us is in the newspaper and the other is not? You know, what happens if, what happens if, uh, uh, um, you know, what happens when your family member starts talking to you that you're adding more value than the other to the business? Yeah. You know, about not letting people participate. You know, we don't let family members work in the company but, so we can make quick decisions. And, and then we develop a set of rules. And I can yeah. share if you want. So, a so, that so I laying, out, laying out that, that framework and that, that playbook to effectively get out ahead of the inevitable challenges that you would face as partners, you found uh, referring to that and applying it in each situation has helped you get through conflict in a more healthy and effective manner. Yes, definitely. I mean, because we, you know, what's the saying goes, you know, is affairs of entry are much easier than affairs of exit. So, I mean, luckily enough, we've been, we're, we do everything together. You know, our search fund investing, everything, you know, our businesses, we're always 50-50 in everything we do. But, so we haven't had an affair of exit, but it's because we really took a lot of time in prepping up the partnership sure. to the levers that we brought our wives to the conversation you know, about what the partnership meant and, 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 and what we were committing as business partners to each other and, and you know. I, I remember the, the dinner with significant others when embarking on the search fund journey for, for myself as being, I, I remember that dinner very vividly. I think it started with my, my, uh, my wife um, saying you're absolutely crazy and uh, this <laughs> might result in me leaving you, but fortunately it, it did not. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Let's shift gears a little bit uh, to the unique challenges associated with conducting an international search. And now you, you see more of uh, you see more of it. There's been more activity in the model outside of the U.S. But but back um, when you were doing your search in Puerto Rico, I think that it was probably a little bit different. So maybe speak to uh, the unique challenges specifically in Puerto Rico, but then also broadly outside of the U.S. where this model is so well defined and traveled. So m many of the Many of, of the operating philosophies that we do to invest today in international search funds do come out from our experiences of when we try to do our search in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, 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 and our, you know, you asked specifically about back in 1996, uh, or, you know, how it was about raising equity in Puerto Rico, you know, it was really tough. You know, it, I mean, nobody knew what this was. Very few people in the U.S. knew so, uh, so and, and we wanted to follow the, the traditional model of, of raising value-added capital, not just capital, right? 
But I, you know, and, and we're just very successful in getting ex clients, successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. of ours that were clients of ours to invest in us. And, and that convinced the U.S. people who we also were very purposeful on, on the people we brought to the table. So we knew we wanted to have people from Puerto Rico because those brought us the social network. We knew we wanted to have people from the U.S. that had experience in search funds because they were the guys who brought to us, you know, the corporate governance and the know-how on how to do this. And we wanted to have certain Latin American investors in case we could grow a business outside of Puerto Rico. Sure. And so we went very methodically about that, and it was an interactive process. What we like to say today for international searchers is that there are many more challenges than in the U.S. You have many countries that have non-developed M&A markets. That, that, uh, and it was alluded in the first session today, you know, how, how bad advice kills deals. And what happens is, is, is you, if, if in these segments you have lawyers and advisors that are not used to seeing M&A activity, they just give to the sellers bad advice, making deals much worse. There are all the cultural differences. You know, I'd rather leave my, I have a son who's, I know is a loser, but I'd rather live in the business than live in cash. You know, uh, there are cultural differences about keeping different sets of books, tax reporting, and, 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 and it, is, you know, it is very convoluted and complicated. And, and you know, one of the things that I have found in some of these markets as well is that, uh, and it happened to us, and that's why we ended up doing a startup, uh, 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 they are, you know, these markets have breadth of industries, but they have no depth. So if you like the widget industry number five, you talk to three players and that's it. You know, and so there's no death. So, so, so it is a different dynamic. And, and we look for certain qualities. Uh, you know, go ahead. No, no, no. So that's, that's a really good segue into the next question around view media. And, and ultimately, give us a little bit of insight into the search process and how you thought about industry focus, how you maybe chased down a couple of opportunities that, that didn't work out in sort of that, that, that two-year period. I, I, I believe it was a two-year period uh, that ultimately led to, at the end, uh, the founding um, of, of View Media. Give us a little bit of insight yeah. into how that all came together. It was actually a three-year period. Three-year. Uh, and, and that's why I always, you know, any international search uh, in developing economies that come to talk to us, I tell them budget for three years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it, in part it was because of our own personal incompetence in searching, but, but it's just different markets, you know. It does take longer to get things done. Um, you, you know, so... So we, we had the approach of, of going and deep diving into a lot of industries, right? And, 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 and for us, the actual decision at the end of the day was, you know, we know that the only variable you actually control when you buy a business is the price you pay to get in. And, and we had a number of deals under even purchase agreement that we didn't close for a number of reasons. You know, many of our deals fell through on due diligence, uh, on due diligence items. And, the, and also it was a, a booming economic cycle and, and we thought that multiples were just not right. Um, we looked at the outdoor advertising industry, it was an industry we loved the, mo the, the business model. Uh, we're very much driven by business models, so we love that business model. And we decided, you know, to go and buy and we couldn't buy because the due diligence just didn't come out right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then it was a big introspection for us, right, about if we should do a startup or not. We've been searching for three years. We, you know, it, it's very glamorous to be sitting here today, but just have an idea. I had a working wife because I cut my salary to zero, right? I mean, it's like the self-funder searchers, right? Because we were committed. For us, we kept every morning, we had a big sign that says, just do like Cortez, right? We burned the ships. There was no going back, <laughs> you know. We were going to get it done. And, 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 and that's part of what happened, you know. And then we wrestled with the decision a lot, and we said, you know, I think the startup route is the way to go. And it was incredible to see our search fund investors say, well, it was about time you guys make that decision. Let's go for it. So that was my next question. They were yeah. largely supportive of the idea to, Very supportive. To, to build something in this market that you obviously had a thesis in, but you just couldn't find a viable target. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that process and that communication yeah. and dialogue with your investors. Yeah, you, you see, I th one of the things we also tell international searchers today, that especially those in developing economies in Latin America, 
And actually, we have we have helped a, 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 a team in India and another one in, and, a, and a woman in, in Africa also. To the you know what we tell them is that it's what we told our investors is we told the entrepreneurs first that yes, I wanted to do a search, I wanted to go acquire a company, but are you willing to do a startup if you find it? And what, the way we define startup is the way we sold it to the investors. You know, uh, it, we coined the phrase that we take the startup risk out of the startup and we make an executional risk. And, and it is because I, I, I don't know how to go out there and compete with Google. That's not what I do. My startup is more of, I know that X industry is about 10 to 15 years behind what it is in Europe and in the US. You know, can I, and I like that industry there. Can I bring best business practices, tropicalize them a little bit, and actually execute better than the existing competitors in the country that I am? And, and that's the type of things that, 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 that we like to promote. And that's how we sold it. I mean, yeah. we, we did. I mean, when we opened up our billboard company, we knew, how, I mean, of course, we learned a lot, but we've done so much research. We had done, you know, a, 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 we have visited a, a billboard companies in the U.S., printers, advertising agencies. We exactly knew what had to be done. So, so we proved to them, guys, it's all about do you bet on us or not? The sure. industry works. So, there, so there's some business execution risk. Maybe let's, let's go back to the international component. Um, unique challenges around operating and, well, founding a business and executing on the plan in Puerto Rico versus it being in the United States and sort of how uh, you guys obviously, uh, the, the, the plan worked and you executed and you built and grew the business. Um, what were some of the unique issues and challenges that you encountered being, uh, being a startup in, in Puerto Rico? Ah, it, it, the unique challenges of being a startup in Puerto Rico. Well, executing on your plan or, or and, and actually on operating the plan. business, yeah. yeah. Well, believe it or not, it, at, at the beginning it was a lot about, you know, search fund is not a proven model. So, so you're there. I mean, you know, you, you were U.S. educated, you, you both undergrad and graduate school. You come back to the island, you got all the banks and investment banks making you job offers. And, and then you're, build, you're mixing cement at seven in the morning on an all-nighter because you're building your second billboard in the financial district. And then all, all your peers are going by saying, this is why you went, you went to business school for that? And, and I go, yes, this is why I went to business school, right? And, and that's, an, that, that's an easily overcomable one, yeah. right? But I think the real challenges, and those go into the culture, but the real challenges are the, the breadth and depth of industry. You know, and, and it just not large, for us in Puerto Rico, it was, it was not a large market, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's one of the reasons we went into the tower business afterwards. We, we really were looking for long runways. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. Right. You and Pochito had uh, the rules of partnership while you were searching. How did those carry over into operating the business? And tell us a little bit about the, um, the roles and how you delineated responsibilities uh, as you were executing on the growth plan. So, 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 it, so the dynamics of our partnership are, um, you know, are, are are very interesting as we operate the companies, right? We first and foremost we have our rules, right? And and, it in, and we have a document we share with anybody who wants to look at it. We have stuff like, you know, the first law is check your ego at the door. Uh, we believe egos are the main cause of killing partnerships. Uh, share growth, share failure. You know, we make decisions behind closed doors, and if it was my decision, it was great. It was both decisions, it was not my decision. Or if it was a failure, it was both decisions, you know. So, we, and that's why we have built this professional respect over time. Uh, what I think is really important as a partnership that you do when you operate a company is that you have very clear, delineated, lines of responsibilities. And they really don't care what they are, but you have to divide it. It has to make sense for the business, right? Because in the eyes of the people who report to you, you they need to know where to go. 
you know, more than one company. We have, we, we, I like to say that we, we, we don't really, don't, we do our mistakes over and over again. We just fix them faster as we do companies, right? Uh, so, so what we al always happens is that the, the employees end up playing the mommy and daddy game. You know, they come and ask me one question and they go and ask my, you know, Pochito the, the same question and they get different answers and then they go, ah, well, they told me this, you know? And as you know, so, so it's very clear about having very delineated responsibilities, but what we like to say in our partnership is that, you know, should one of us unfortunately die tomorrow, the other one knows exactly what's going on in the business, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's, it's that face that you give in public and then all the, uh, you know, alignment that you do behind closed doors yeah, in it's, the partnership. That's obviously, there's a balance there, right? Staying in your lane and knowing the, the clearly articulated roles and responsibilities, yeah. but also if, if one person is to not show up at work the next day, knowing how to, how to keep uh, the, the enterprise yeah. moving forward. That's a, tr a tricky balance. And, and that is the only way, right? Again, it's about adding value exponentially, right? And uh, the only way we can both add value is if we intimately know what the other one is doing. You grew the business, obviously uh, had, a, had a wonderful outcome for uh, yourselves and for your investors. Um, talk to us a little bit about the exit process, um, how it might have been uh, unique given your partnership or the fact that the company was based in, in Puerto Rico, some of the challenges. Uh, and then I'd like to get into a little bit of uh, discussion around the sort of the life after uh, the search and exit. Uh, but maybe we start with the actual exit and how it all came together after you uh, had done as much work and, and execution on the plan as you and Pochito did? So our exit, it, it's funny because our, ex, our exit came about from a competitor approaching us and saying that they wanted to buy us out, a, a publicly traded company different from the one who ended up buying us. So when they approached us, what we did is we actually, it, it, I think one of the values that we bring to the table as search funders is that you know, we run processes, right? And, and, and one, so one of the things we did is, well, you know, if they're interested, um, you know, might be the right time to sell, let's run a process. So we run a process. And, in the, and I, I think of an interesting story that happens to us is that in the middle of that process, we had our first down quarter. Not, I mean, our, our first quarter that we, that, that we didn't grow the company by, you know, by our budget. So, so it was actually a first down quarter uh, in, in the midst of the process. And, 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 and we took the very difficult decision of take, when we already had selected a partner, of taking the company off the table on a deal that would have probably yielded about 35% net IRR to investors. Mm -hmm. and, and we took that decision. Uh, the reasons that happened, was a, 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 you know, we completely knew what it was. It was, a, 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 it, it was because we were trying to install a, 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 a president for the company and, and that was just not the right person. And we were just denying it. But when we saw the sales were going down, we had personally made a commitment that we didn't want to operate once we sold the company. So we wanted to leave management in place. So we decided not to sell. Roll off our sleeves again, which is really hard. You were already check it out at the beach, you know. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, roll off the sleeves again and 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 operate again, and and we did that. And I think one of the beauties is one of the things I tell everybody who asks me is is, is you know is, is you gotta have a great asset. Every decision you make, you gotta you gotta ask yourself, you know, in your business, you you gotta ask yourself, you know, is this a long term decision or not? Is this the best decision? It doesn't preclude you from every morning looking out the window and asking yourself, you know, are the dark clouds over there? Should I sell the business today or not? And again, that dichotomy of, 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 of having long-term decisions with knowing when to exit gives you better options. And my better option at that point in time was keep operating a great business that we had on our hands. Yeah, so, so you're going through the process um, like the CEO's worst nightmare, the numbers soften a little bit during a process, obviously um, a, a, a really good way to sort of rattle the market and maybe uh, uh, kill a deal at the end of the day. You guys decide to pull out of the process. You sort of right the ship, get it back. You get through the exit and you ultimately sell. And it was a, and it was a great outcome. Um, 
my, my teaching partner, Mark Agnew, is in the room, so, so I need to ask this question about your, your feelings and your emotional state of mind during that sale process. So talk to us a little bit about um, how, what, what, what you were going through, what you and Pochita were going through after this business that you, you, you didn't even acquire. You started this from, from, from scratch, and uh, now it's no longer your baby. Help us, help us understand the, the feeling think, and the emotional element there. I think you used the key word, baby. Uh, it, 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 we have, I have a very funny story about that because um, we were on the closing, and I think this illustrates what it is. Uh, we were on the closing at my lawyer's office, uh, uh, and, and we just signed the papers. And for some reason, the lawyer wanted us to be sequestered in a room until the wire transfer came about. Uh, so, Pochita and I are sitting down there in the room, and, and I go to Pochita. I go, you know, Pochita, I'm, I'm very sad. You know, I'm, I'm a little hurt, you know, uh, that we're letting go. I mean, this, this was our baby. It's a great business. And Pochito, which is a great guy, so don't judge me by this comment, please. He goes to me, oh, you're such a beep, you know. I mean, just look at your bank account. You know, we're going to be happy. Forget about it, you know. <laughs> I go, okay, I'm the soft in the partnership, you know. <laughs> so next day, next day we go to, to, to announce to the company. And we literally announced and left and never came back to the company. Uh, we left management in place. Uh, so we go, we announce it. And I think the real funny story is that I go first and I say, well, guys, you know, this is what's happening. And, uh, you know, we give thanks to everybody and, and all of that. And then when Pochito goes off stage and starts talking, he starts crying in stage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of how attached he was to the company. And I go... Bang, it hit you, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it is very emotional. Yeah. yeah so you, 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 you spend your, you know, you, you, it, 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 it makes it emotional. I mean, it, you created this and, and, and there's a cost. I, I miss stages of development of my son. I, I, I know this, you know, I miss important steps of his life just because I was working and, yeah. and that's the dichotomy that nowadays I try to strive of making much better, you know, making certain the business does well, but that there's a family life going on because it's not worth it missing them. You, you've teed me up nicely for the last thing that I'd like to talk about, which is um, how you measure success. You, you probably had a different idea about the metrics and the scoreboard for success when you came out of business school and decided to pursue a search fund model. Um, you've had an exit. You now uh, are looking after QMC, which is a, a, a profitable and growing enterprise. Um, what, is, what does success look like to you, Jose? So success, you know, success for me, again, it's, it's, it's about Success is about, you know, having your goals and, 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 of course, having your goals and meeting them. You know, we can go to the dictionary and I find that one. But, 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 but it, it is about that balance, again, in life, right? I, um, it, it, it is about, for me, it's about having a plan that builds on itself and, and, and you're achieving the, the things that you want to do. I, you know, and, and I tell you what I'm the most proud of today, you know, it's when, when we did our business plan for the search fund company, for the billboard company, it was funny because when we, f we were doing our financial modeling, and if you, and, and, and it was mentioned this morning as well, I think it was a great comment, if you looked at the financial forecast, even on an optimistic case scenario, you know, it, 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 it would have been better for us to go out and get jobs in banking again. Mm -hmm. But for us, that was part of the game. For us, it was as important getting a hit under the belt, getting the experience of management that we wanted to get, and, and, and going out there and, 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 and getting, you know, getting experience, because this for us was a stepping stone, just like we got our banking jobs because it was a stepping stone, this was a stepping stone into being able to invest in companies, into being able to continue operating and, and having an even bigger uh, uh, entrepreneurial life. You know, we were lucky enough that, I mean, we beat our optimistic expectations, you know, exponentially. And we never thought the business was going to grow that much. But if we had stuck to the financial numbers, 
we at the, the investor did well, but we weren't going to do that well. But, but again, for us, it was more than the money. And, and one of the things I always look for in people when they ask me, you know, is the entrepreneurial life good for me? You know, I, I like to ask, what are your motivating factors to be an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, that, and, and, and it's funny because if you tell me it's money and nothing else, you know, I have an issue because when you count your money every morning, some days you're going to have a lot and some days you're not going to have any. And, and you know, you're just going to quit because there's risk. It's, it's risk. It's volatility, right? And, and, you know, I want to see something next to it. Now, if you tell me you just do it because you want to be a manager, uh, you know, I don't think that's the right answer either. You know, I look for both. I look for people who are motivated by a profit motif and people who have other personal ambitions in doing what they're doing. And I think that was the mix that really said to us, you know, the profit, oh, no, we'll make a, it's okay, and we'll move on. And, you know, it, it just happened, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's about swinging the bat to hit the ball, right? And we yeah. took a swing, and we were lucky enough to get it, you know, to do I'd say you made pretty well. good contact. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we did. Hey, uh, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but we probably have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Yeah, we've got um, about five, 10 minutes for questions. So again, we have runners. Any? We've got a couple up front here. Thank you. First off, go blue. Yeah. So uh, my question is, I'm, I'm going to be pursuing the search fund model when I graduate, and I've been wrestling with the idea of going solo or going with the partnership. And uh, the question is, when you're going with the partnership and you have some dis disagreement, what are some of the steps that you've taken or methods that you've done to help preserve the overall relationship with that business partnership? Again, it's about trust. I mean, my, my partner and I, it's funny. I mean, we, I mean, it's been 20 years, right? We, we think, we come to the same conclusions, but, but that comes after a lot of debating. I mean, we, we have developed a process and it's, it's, a, it's just through experience on us that if we disagree, we agree to debate it. And, and, and we just have very open agreements. Uh, sometimes it gets a little personal, especially always at the beginning. It is like, you know, like you take it personal if they're criticizing your idea. But what we have discovered is that by having an honest discussion about the disagreement, we do come up with a better idea. And what usually happens at the end of the day, uh, on, on, uh, and this doesn't apply to all, there, there's that one percentage of decisions that you have to be completely aligned, but, but there are many important decisions that we might be in disagreement, and what we have learned is to defer to the other one depending on the subject matter. So if it's something that it's truly my my piece of cake, I think it is, yeah, you know, that I know really well. So Pochito might, you know, gives me his full thought and he says, you know, well, I'm going to defer on this one to you, you know. And, and we have that, that level of trust in each other's ability to be able to do that. And, but, but it's not easy and you have to spend a lot of time on understanding and be open-minded open in understanding why the other person is disagreeing and where your idea might be at fault. Other questions? Hi, my name is Bakari Pace. Um, I'm hoping one day after a successful exit to be an investor in this community, because I like it so much and I like that many people who go through the search end up becoming investors as well. But I kind of want to understand a little bit of what your personal motivation was around that, uh, maybe your philosophy, maybe some economic profile, just like the type of thing that when you're thinking about being an investor, you know, after, because there's a lot of different ways you can use liquid capital um, after you, you know, have a successful exit. You can be a venture capitalist, a lot of different things, but why you specifically chose to come back to the search fund? So, uh, so again, I, I think there are, there are two main motivating drivers. I think, I, I, and, and in no specific order, because they are equally important to me. I, I think that the community has given me a lot. And the only way I can truly repay back that is by you know, helping other people do it as well. Uh, and, and that's number one, and that's one that I, I take dear to my heart. It, in, in recent years, it's been a little bit harder because, I mean, the QMC, is, the tower company is growing. But, but I do try to spend the time doing that. And then the, the parallel one is that I think it's a great asset class. It's an asset class I understand. It's an asset class that I, I believe in it. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, I'd rather, 
I, I rather put my money here than in, in other alternative investments that I have. Any other questions? I see one back there. Ash, thank you both. Um, so my question, you mentioned sort of the balance with family. So for those of us who have significant others, kids, what advice would you have for someone sort of starting out in this world um, when things can be tough and things can get bad and take a lot of work and that sort of thing? Quit sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what I did. I marry better than me. You know, your partner has to be there for you because it's, it's, cause that partner is the one who picks up the slag. Because you just cannot be in two places at once. And, and you consciously have to make a decision that you know you're going to be missing part of that. And, and hopefully, you know, hopefully you are a little bit, you know, uh, uh, who is it that says, you know, to have a balanced life, sometimes you have to unbalance it. But you have to remember that you've got to balance it again. And don't get stuck on the unbalanced part of it. I'd add, I'd add one thing around... Um uh, organization and time management and, and really um, doing some reflection on uh, what's important in life and what's important to you both per personally and professionally and prioritizing your time because there are a finite uh, number of hours during the day and some of those probably should be spent sleeping. Um, but uh, you really have to do some prioritization when we all lead as, as busy lives as we do. Um, especially when you uh, prioritize as highly as I know Jose does and, and I do and many of you do, uh, family. Um, so it's, it's about prioritization and, and for me it's uh, time management. That's very true. Okay, well please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so now we've got an opportunity to get up out of your seat a bit. Uh, so we're going to have two sessions going on at the same time. Uh, one breakout will be upstairs on the ninth floor where we had the lunch. That will be the lessons learned from adversity panel. So we have a couple of phenomenal operators who are willing to share some of the um, some of the adversity they've had to overcome in their careers. And then in this room we have the young CEO experience panel. So. We encourage you to go upstairs if that's your interest, but feel free to stay here as well. There are drinks and snacks upstairs. Um, starts at two, thank you.